Welcome to Tough Conversations with David Wood, where play meets depth. We help teams and high-performing leaders like you to master your tough conversations so you succeed in your career and in your life. When we avoid tough conversations, we stay small. Teams stay disengaged, conflicted, and ultimately end up quitting. When we lean in and master our tough conversations, they become the defining moments that literally shape our careers, our relationships, and our lives. So let's dive in and master your next tough conversation so you can be the leader that you would follow. Let's play. Welcome high performers. This is an unusual episode. Nancy Moonstar from A Man's Guide to Intimacy, uh, the podcast, reached out to me and said, I love how you show up on podcast. I really appreciate what you're teaching. And would you be willing to be a guest on my podcast? Now, I haven't spoken or talked about man-woman dynamics for some time. I don't consider myself a relationship expert or a marriage expert. I'm a communications expert. But of course, relationships require communication. And at one time, I did actually write a book, uh, two books about man-woman dynamics. And uh, it's fun for me. Nancy had some amazing questions like, are there, is there a place for gender roles? You know, traditional roles or different roles. And uh, we didn't directly address the Me Too movement, but we kind of looked at the landscape in today's society. How does a man show up? Uh, how does a man generate intimacy? And she asked me this amazing question, how can a man invite his woman to surrender? So uh, I love this so much that I've decided to publish it on my own podcast. I hope you get a lot out of it and uh, I'd love you to send me any questions or comments. Let's dive into it with Nancy Moonstar. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Moonstar, psychologist who's creating this show, A Man's Guide to Intimacy. I'm welcoming a very special coach and guest speaker who is an expert at difficult, deep conversations of which this topic is about. He has coached uh, a gazillion people. He's been number one coach by Google. He's uh, been an actuary for top um, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he's overcome challenges in his own life, and he is transformational in his approach. So he uses all these difficult things to grow and become the biggest version of yourself, and he's done that with himself. Uh, I welcome David Wood. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, that's a very warm welcome. I feel... Uh, I feel wanted here, and that feels good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, very much so. So I'm curious what what it was that drew you so quickly to saying you would join in and be interviewed on this series. Um, it was a man's guide to intimacy. It was a title. I'm a big fan of intimacy. I've spent uh, the first 25 years of my life, I didn't know much about it. The last 25 years, I've been focused a lot on how to have deeper connections with people, which actually helps business results as well as life results. And um, I'm particularly interested in men's work. I just talked to a friend yesterday and he, we were talking about how um, men need to do their own work and actually get a lot of our needs met from other men so that we're not so hungry for the women in our lives. And uh, the timing of that conversation was interesting because I've just been invited last week to join a men's group. And I said, yes, I said, I'll come along and, and check it out. So I, I'm interested in that whole field of how men can connect more deeply to themselves and to everyone else in their life, which includes their partner. What do you think makes it more difficult for men to do the self work? And, and do this thing we're talking about? Well, I don't know anything about uh, uh, biology, so I don't know if there's something different about our brains, but I know that my upbringing was different and the things that I was told as a kid and what was modeled for me, it's, I mean, if you see a, a if a woman cries, she's, she's almost expected to do that. 
But if a man cries in Australia, there was a lot of, uh, you know, we'll just toughen up. And, you know, I think a lot of kids have probably heard from their parents, you know, I'll give you something to cry about mm -hmm. if you keep crying. But I imagine it's even more so for men. There's an image of, you know, I need to be tough. I need to get out there and kill the bear. And I didn't, I didn't even know what I was feeling. I think until I was 40, I mm. might know I'm feeling bad or I'm feeling good. That's it. So for me to even first reveal to myself what's happening was a big deal. And then secondly, am I willing to reveal that to my partner? Mm. I think those are the, the two big questions. So I wasn't trained. I actually think most humans are not well trained in both of those things, but for a man, it's, uh, it's culturally, uh, it has been culturally less acceptable, but I think that's shifting. And if you and I have anything to say about it, it'll shift quicker. So do you think there is, and what would be the difference between the enculturation from Australia to, to the US or to other cultures? I, I, I was told 20 years ago that Australia is a bit, uh, about 20 years behind the US in uh in a lot of things that uh it, we're behind the us in some good things and we're behind the us in some bad things mm -hmm. so um and in other ways i think australia is ahead of the us but one area where they suggested we were behind was in how we treat women and the equality of women and the entrenched uh misogyny i think is the you know this is discrimination the us has been doing better than Australia in terms of how do we treat women with respect and how do we stop treating women as less than, and we still have a long way to go in the U S but I think Australia has got a little bit, a mm -hmm. bit further. It's just more culturally acceptable, but you know, like we have a joke in Australia, um, uh, men in the front, women and dogs in the back. <laughs> we would say that and it was just a ha ha whatever now i bet the women weren't laughing about it really on the inside as much but that was kind of like it's like it's okay to say that oh in Australia. wow wow okay yeah i thought you know it was almost a joke but wow. well it is a joke but it's not a very uh nice joke um oh particularly since women are already treated as less than if they weren't then it might be funny just like you can joke about a man, you could say that about a man because men have the power generally. So you, get, you can take shots at men, but it's not okay to take shots at women anymore in the US because you recognize that that's not very cool mm. um, because they are discriminated against, so you can't do it. You still take jokes at men. Okay, so um, I'm gonna read something from a book. <laughs> It, it's it's a fun book. See if you can you might be able to guess where it's from. It's from sort of a fairy tale. Why don't you pick on somebody your own size instead of bothering the lady? Tramp shouted at the pack of dogs. Tramp fought like a tiger, and when he was through, those bullies couldn't run away fast enough. Lady thanked Tramp for rescuing her. Then she told him all about her troubles. What's your reaction to that? You're talking about male role here and you're talking about conditioning and I just thought of that little clip from first of all you know you know what I was reading from uh, Lady in the Tramp mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my my reaction is that I think this points towards a useful and interesting and desirable model that 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 men and women uh, can profit from so, but first let's talk about another model. Like another model is we're all the same. There are no differences. Mm -hmm. And um, in our relationship, the man and the woman are going to relate like that. You know, we're humans. I think, I think there are more fun models that can be used um, where we can take advantages of some of the differences in the masculine and feminine polarity. Now, I don't mean man, woman polarity. I mean, masculine, feminine. Some women have more masculine than feminine and some men have more feminine than masculine. But I, in my world, it's fun 
if a woman says, yeah, I'd like you to open the door for me, that'd be nice. And if there's a burglar in the house, I'd like you to go and handle it if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. And I might take on some more feminine roles, like having the house look really beautiful and reminding us to flow and feel more of our emotions. And I like that, you know, that's fun for me. I think where it becomes unfun is if people are pigeonholed and a woman is expected that she's going to clean the house and she's going to look after the kid without any conversation about it. Or if the man is expected that he's not going to show his emotions or he's going to be the breadwinner and it's not talked about and it's not consciously decided. So that's when the roles I think become counterproductive and unfun. But if you can choose your own roles as a woman, I want to do all this kind of stuff. And as a man, I want to do all this kind of stuff and we can give to each other in that way, which is what I heard in that story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, to me, it connects with chivalry and yeah. Well, t yeah. Tell me a little bit about where you see that in building intimacy for men, where is the place for that? What is that exactly? And well, there's that old thing that, intimacy if you slow it slow down the word is into me you see mm -hmm. so i think intimacy is is a is largely about truth telling <clears throat> and i just went and looked up speaktruth.com to see if, I, I knew it wouldn't be available but I, I i've been i talk about tough conversations and i've realized recently that a sexier way to say that is simply speak your truth Mm -hmm. and then stick around to listen to the reaction. And mm -hmm. that's a tough conversation. So I forgot the question I was answering. Oh, it's okay. I'm just oh yeah. Talking. No, I remember now, but I just um, accidentally modeled what I'm talking about. That instead of trying to fake it, I told you, mm -hmm. I forget the question I was answering. So mm -hmm. I think you know, how this shows up, how these models or these roles show up uh, for intimacy is speak your truth. As a woman, I would like you to first reveal your truth to yourself and realize, oh, I want this. Here's how I want to show up in relationship. And here's how I'd love my man to show up in relationship. Mm -hmm. And as you speak that truth um, and it gets received, then you have intimacy. Same for a man. What are the things that are not working for you in a relationship? Can you find an artful way to bring those up? What are your desires? How do you want to show up? How would you like your partner to show up? And as you're willing to reveal that and it can be heard by your partner, then you've got intimacy. Even if your partner doesn't agree, let's say you want something in the bedroom and you find an artful way to bring it up. If your partner says, no way am I doing that, but um, you get to share it and your partner understands you, like, oh, I can totally get why you'd want that. You know, I got some desires too, we can talk about too. I'm not going to do it, but I'm glad you told me that you're closer. You don't actually need the result you're looking for to have intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, I think intimacy comes from the sharing and revealing of yourself and having it being received. So, so what's the difficulty in the bedroom for the guy? What is it that he finds maybe most difficult to address and have that tough conversation? Wow. Well, I don't know for men in general, but I can, I can talk about for myself. Um, I think, I think one thing for me is, um, performance anxiety like am I going to perform and particularly for you know for, for women you know if they're not fully aroused it, it doesn't make as much of a difference as if the guy is an erect mm -hmm. and then you know you just look at a guy and you can tell he's not he's not ready for sex so there's there's more performance anxiety sometimes there and particularly I've always found that often I'm great until it comes time to put the condom on and then it's like Oh my God. And there's embarrassment and then I'll lose the erection and you know, whole, all of that. So I found that very difficult in my early years. And now it's a lot easier because I've learned how to talk about it. 
mm. and say, all right, if this happens, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not into you, but this is something that often happens the first few times with a condom. And then after the first time that it's successful, it's not a problem. I've learned how to share that. Wow. Thank you. So that's one issue. And here's another thing that has been an issue for me. I don't, I don't know if other guys have this, but sometimes I worry, like if we're going to have a date, I know we're switching the roles here, but I worry about expectations. See, I don't, I, I often say to a, to, to a date, look, I, I don't have any expectation. There's no requirement for us to be sexual. And also I want you to know it's not guaranteed. I never know how my body's going to react or how I'm going to feel. I might be really turned on. I might not be turned on. So what do you say? Um, we flow with it and see how we both feel. And if we're both a yes to something, we'll do that. Try and take the pressure off. But again, it's taken me a long time to realize that, that I'm not a sure thing and I might have desires, but I don't think I have any, you know, big expectations about the other person. So those are two issues for me and I've learned how to speak about them, but I still get nervous about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. So I'm going to go back to a point in a little bit I read. So protecting a woman and how does that show up? And you, I thought I heard you say something about opening a door. And so what, what does that mean to protect, take care of? And do women need that? And how much of that do they need? And then my mind kind of goes to, um, are women always kind of carrying around a lot that they need? sort of this assistance so they can feel free like lady did like now I can tell you about my troubles and <laughs> okay I, th I think I heard three questions in there so um firstly I for people who are listening to this if you can't see the video my face is lit up hearing this question I know that I feel emotional and I think what's happening is it touches in a part of me that I love to be the protector mm. And I don't say that, I don't imply that other men should feel like that because they, they may not, but it's inherent in me. Um, if a woman's being threatened or they like, like I've, I've gone to, um, to sex clubs, uh, not for a while, but I used to go to like sex parties and sex clubs and I'd be there with a, with a really beautiful woman and she might be vulnerable and exposed and, and all the guys are like trying to get a piece of her. I'm like a bouncer. I will throw myself between her and anyone else. And I like being trusted and I like being able to give her that space and that protection. So I have that desire and it's fulfilling for me. And in this day and age and in, you know, because of, I think how women have been treated and disempowered and treated as weak, for some women, um, <clears throat> what they want is to be treated as an equal and to be treated as someone powerful. So in this day and age, I like to check. When I remember and check in, I, I was at a conference recently with a good buddy of mine. He was running it and he had a team dinner. And he said... A what dinner? A team dinner for the team. Yeah. And he said... If the ladies are willing, um, we'd like you to go first in getting your food. Hmm. I thought that was artfully done. Hmm. He didn't hmm. just assume. He said, if you're willing, Aww. we would like that. So for any women who are like, don't treat me as like I need special treatment. I've got a friend who hates anyone treating her like she needs to be cared for because hmm. it triggers a part of her that wants to be seen as powerful. Hmm. So I don't assume... If a woman wants that, let's talk about it and let's, you know, I can give her that. And if she doesn't want that, if she doesn't want that, she's probably not going to end up being my partner because I enjoy the polarity. I love it when a woman feels relaxed enough and trusts me enough that she can surrender and surrender to um, my direction. That's, that's really fulfilling for me. But I don't assume that every woman's going to want that. Are you familiar with the, the, the David Data three stages? No, tell, tell me a little oh, bit. 
oh, this is, this is huge. This, I, I'd say this was a life changer for me. So these three stages are wonderful so that each of us can work out where we are. The first stage is rednecked men and submissive housewives. Let's go back to the 50s where women should be seen and not heard. They're told what to do and the guys are pretty obnoxious. They might have even been wife beaters, who, who knows, but that's first stage. And then society went, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not cool. So the women started to become more and more independent and like, I need to prove my worth. And um, some of them went over the top to become ball busting women mm -hmm. in the corporate world, which can be powerful, but then they weren't always able to switch off and relax into the feminine. They just became more masculine. And on the flip side, you've got the men going into the forest and playing guitar and, and maybe dancing and smoking marijuana, which is a very feminine practice and growing their hair long. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, it's just great. They're getting in touch with their feelings and they're like, I hear you. Do you hear me? <laughs> but what you got was spineless spiritual wimps. <laughs> so in the second stage, it's an advancement. You've got women who are more independent and men who are more in touch with their feelings, but you can get ball busting women who can't um, feel their heart and spineless spiritual wimps who can't stand up and go and handle a burglar or, um, or be a man when it's needed. So he talks about third stage, which seems to be the Holy grail where a woman realizes her power she's able to think in a linear fashion and to be in control and manage a team of people and do anything a man can do. And she places a high value on opening her heart and flowing and feeling and surrendering when she finds a man worthy uh, and, and able to hold that container. And similarly, a man, he can feel his feelings. He has an open heart and if a burglar comes into the house and he needed to kill to defend his family, he can do that too. So he has a strong, uh, I think Brene Brown says, strong back, soft front. Mm. So mm. I, I just, I really took, and David Data's got a book for, for men. It's called Way of the Superior Man, which is a very provocative title. I love that book. And I've, I think almost every woman I've met has loved that book. She's like, yes, I want this. I want men like this. Mm -hmm. and, and the one for women specifically, I think is called Dear Lover. And I haven't read that. Wow. Thank you. That was really helpful. It, it <laughs> kind of reminded me of my worst bosses. Almost yeah. always were women. Um, you know, they couldn't say, you make me look bad because you're so good. For example, there was jealousy. They, could, they couldn't stop and pay attention to intuition. Uh, or, or, yeah, and, and so I would <laughs> experience being hammered, and et cetera. <laughs> for, yeah. 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 I think we want the, the best of both worlds and we can have it. And for a man, the men that I respect are the ones that can cry. They, they're not falling apart. They might be crying and sobbing as they release emotion, but they're still present. Mm -hmm. And um, again, if a burglar was in the house, they could respond, but they're willing to feel all those feelings. And they're also willing to say to their, to their woman, no, if she's doing something that's not serving her in the world, mm -hmm. he can draw a line and say, hey, that's not okay. It's not like, oh, I hear you. Do you hear me? And whatever. Sometimes... Um, I know a group of people that, that, that say, give the woman everything. It works better if you give the woman everything she wants. 90% of the time. Mm. They, say, they, they believe that 10% of the time, a woman wants a man to be able to draw a line and mm. say, you know, you don't want a doormat. Mm -hmm. So I think we can have the best of, of both worlds, feeling men with open hearts who can also do... Um, some of the tough work that's required that a woman may not want to do. So I'm going to go back to a word I heard you mention a couple of times, surrender and a woman surrendering to you. Uh, and what does that mean 
to you, to a man, and how can he, a man, men on these shows, um, invite more of that? Ooh, wow. <laughs> All right, two big questions. We'll see what comes out. So the first one, what does that mean to me or what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first thing that comes up is physically. If I'm touching a woman and she enjoys my touch and relaxes, which allows her to enjoy even more touch, it relaxes into a space of trust, I can feel that. Mm. And I can respond. And, you know, sexually, I'm a space holder. And I've done a lot of uh, BDSM, bondage, domination uh, stuff as well. I've done workshops. I've trained in it. Mm. And it really speaks to, to what we've been talking about with the, the masculine feminine polarity and surrender. It's basically one person is in charge and the other person's job is to surrender. So it's great for man woman dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I find, um, I'm wondering how, how honest I'm going to be here. I think I'm going to be pretty honest. Like for yeah. example, if, if, I'm having sex with a woman and she's fully surrendered. She may not be tracking her noise levels or how the neighbors are, or if someone's going to call the police or something like that, because she's, she's the river that's flowing mm. and her, that's her, her job. Should she want to take on that surrendered feminine mm. role is to trust me to hold that space. Now I am tracking that, um, I am aware of like with the neighbors, is this too much or whatever? Does she need water? Whatever. Like there's part of me that's present. The, the role of the, a fun role for the masculine is to be the riverbanks so she can flow and rage and do whatever she does. And he's holding that space. Mm. So that's an example sexually and physically in terms of touch, but it could show up too. Um, it could show up in, it might show up in another way in terms of um, if she's not sure, doesn't have a clear desire of what we're going to do for the evening. She might uh, want me to choose and provide direction. Sometimes women want that. They're just like, I just want the guy to like, or, or at least to have an idea. And so I might run a menu past her. Well, here are three things that I'm thinking of. Mm. And this way she gets me to be providing direction, but she still gets to choose. Mm. So those are just a couple of things that come to mind with, um, with surrender. And your next question was, what was your next question? That was a good well, one. How to invite that. So you've started in on that and, um, you know, you yeah. also meant, go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Because you, you mentioned sort of non well, you mentioned touch. So we've got non sexual touch, sensual, sexual, you know. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that or. Well, go talk on. about inviting. Um, I think the more a man can generate trust and be trustworthy the more a woman can relax and, and trust his guidance. And I had a date with a woman once who, who had a, she's a podcast host and she, she had a blog and she wrote an article after our date called eight ways he had me trust him. It was uh, quite extraordinary. One way that I, think that I generate trust is by checking in and asking. So for example, let's say I'm sitting with someone and we're having a good time and it seems, and I kind of want to put my hand on her leg. This is a bit of a, a, a catch 22 because again, in this day and age, a lot of people, women and men want to be asked um, because if you just assume, then how are they going to trust you? Particularly if you got it wrong. But I do believe a lot of women want a man to feel in and to be a mind reader and to just know 
Like he knew that I was ready for that. So it's a bit tricky, but you got to be careful in this day and age. So I tend to err on the side of asking and I'll be like, you know, I might raise my hand and put it close to her leg and say, may I put my hand on your knee? Mm. And then I'm listening for an answer, but I'm also watching for an answer. And if there's any hesitation, I might be like, not yet. Let's leave it. Um, if I find that I have put my hand on her knee, like we're having a great talk and we're close to each other and it just seems natural, I might have an afterthought. Wait a minute. Or I might have an intuition. Wait a minute. Just with any doubt. It's worth asking, hey, is my hand okay on your knee or is it still okay here? Mm. And I almost always find that uh, women appreciate that. They're like, I like, thank you for checking in. And I think I can almost feel her relax a little bit more. This guy's got attention on me. This guy wants to know if this is okay. This guy wants me to have a good time. He's not just pursuing his own agenda. I really like that. And I uh, heard how sensitive you are. And I heard you say listening and watching uh, because, yeah. Yeah, so, because there's sort of a influence women aren't taught to really say what they want. And yeah. that's it's still, I mean, guys have, have some of this too, but, and so there can be, I'm supposed to be nice and I'm, yeah, I'm good or yes, or okay. or Yeah. And I, I, and I don't want to put her in the awkward position of having to say no, because that could feel awkward. So I might read a no and say, let's wait on that. And, you know, I'm excited about this concept of listening mm. because, um, I think for the first 25 years of my life, I didn't really know much about it. And then I was lucky enough to discover some people who were very good at it and they trained me and I'm still a student of this. Um, but I think, you know, you're listening when you ask, can I put my hand in your leg? But during sex as well, and this is speaking to your question, how do you invite surrender? It's a dance. And you're constantly listening. If I'm just with my own sensations and lost in my own sensations, which is what I want for a woman, then I'm not listening to her body. But if I'm constantly got those ears open, let's imagine you've got ears all over your body and you're constantly listening, then you might be kissing passionately but I'm constantly putting out feelers for like, is this still, is this what's wanted? And if I'm not sure, I'll pull back a little bit and check. And then she might come towards me and start kissing me stronger. I'm like, all right, we're in the right, right zone here. Mm -hmm. so, so, so how do you check? Pardon? How do you check? Well, you can check partly by taking a step back. You can check by taking your hand off her leg or kissing more gently, slowing down. Mm -hmm. and then waiting. Sometimes it's really clear. She's giving a signal. She's making sounds and whatever. It's like, no, this is exactly what's wanted. But then when you have any doubt, what a great time to either ask verbally or just back off a little bit. And I don't know exactly how I developed this radar, but I've, I'm so grateful for it. There might be, you know, I'd be time having intercourse and, you know, strong thrust. And then the, thought will just flick through my head. Wait a minute. I can't tell if this is exactly what she's wanted. Let's not just assume that what women want are really hard thrusts. Um, so I'll slow down and give her a chance to, to show some, some signals. Mm -hmm. And I think this is another way that we can invite surrender as men by listening and by putting a lot of attention on a woman can have her realize, oh wait, this is a safe space. This guy has got me. This guy's got his attention on me. Mm. These are my theories, right? I don't pretend to be a guru on this and I'm still learning, I'm still a student and I still make mistakes for sure. I'm just, I'm sharing some of the things that I'm excited about that I've found um, seem to work well for me. Oh, I like what I'm hearing, and uh, this is very helpful because 
I get questions from men, you know, how do I get more of this? How do I have more body intimacy, uh, sex? And, and what do I do? What, what about men who've had a period of time where their beloved, their wife or whoever is, isn't responding, isn't showing interest, isn't engaging? What, what then? Yeah. What, I, I try not to speak in universal truths, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it now. In that case, what she's wanting is not sex primarily. I say she's wanting attention. Mm. And attention will show the guy what she's wanting. And there's a joke if you want, you know, there's a joke from women where they say, the foreplay I want is cleaning the house mm. right now that i don't think that's a universal truth but she might be wanting the man to do more around the house and by him doing that if that's the case he's showing that he cares about what she wants and it's kind of a joke but it's kind of it's kind of true now if let's say i'm wanting sex from my partner and she's not responding or she's not wanting it well maybe i could get curious about her all right, I've got this desire. That's fine. I can enjoy that. I can share the desire. I have that. But what do you want right now? Mm -hmm. What's going on for you? Mm -hmm. Is there something you want to talk about? Is there something in between us that, that needs resolving? Is there something I'm not giving you that, that I could give you right now, which might be cleaning the house. It might be cooking a meal or something like that. I think that's a great place to start because it gives you intimacy. Mm -hmm. It may not get your sex that night or immediately, but you're going to be closer with your partner. And I would also want to know if I have a desire to have more sex, I'd want to know, is there something that might be fun for her that would be in the direction of that? Maybe mm. we're not going to have intercourse. Maybe we're not going to get naked. Maybe we're not going to do anything that leads towards that. If she's feeling shy about that, maybe, we could give each other foot rubs. See, most people like pleasure. Mm. They really do. It's just, if I'm a woman, I may not want to, can I, can I say fuck on this? Or we can't yeah. say it. All right. Yeah. I may not, I may not want to fuck for various reasons, but I still like pleasure. I don't want to feel obligated that I'm going to have to put out. But if I'm offered a foot rub and it really is honestly non-reciprocal, I might want that. Uh, I might be happy to give my, give my man uh, a shoulder rub, but I'm just not feeling sexual. Then we can go to a second stage, which um, there's a, I keep talking about this group. I should give them a name, the Moore House, or it used to be Moore University is an incredible trainer of man, woman mm -hmm. stuff. And they taught me that, most people like pleasure. And if a woman knew she wasn't on the hook to have to reciprocate or fuck, she might actually say yes to receiving pleasure. Mm -hmm. So um, I trained with them on how to, uh, on manual stimulation, how to use my hands to give a woman pleasure. And she might keep her clothes on largely, right? Stay, stay largely dressed. And it's like, I'm going to set a timer for 20 minutes or 30 minutes I'm just going to do what feels good to your body and I'm going to ask you questions and I'm going to listen and I'm going to give you pleasure and you're not going to give me anything afterwards. If you want to do me tomorrow, okay, but the same day, no. Wow. Oh, what a concept. That's a, yes, it was rather new in recent years for me to understand you could have such pleasure with clothes on, for example. Um, yeah. And you might find if you're starting to, you know, have that sexy time, it might lead to her having a desire for more. I've done it with women and she's like, I want you to penetrate me now. So it's a nice, there's the foot rub is a nice way to lead into just having connection and touch. And then you can see, all right, would, would one of us like some manual stimulation Mm -hmm. And we could do that with, with no strings attached. I find that's pretty safe. And that can start to develop the connection and the intimacy. And then maybe that'll lead to intercourse and she might have a desire for that or maybe not, but you can have a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of good times with manual stimulation 
and putting attention on your partner. So let me, I, I like that thing. Um, so going back, let's get back a little bit. You're describing finding out what she really wants. And then you're also talking about pleasure. So there were two, two directions we could go here. Yep. What well, I'm glad that you um, delineated those. That's right. Two separate conversations. Okay. So um, what do you think is tough for a guy because it, it, it means he's really got to get off his goal directedness or we're going to have penetration or. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what is it that's, yeah. What challenges a guy in that? And of course, as a psychologist, I, you know, know some of these conversations, but let me hear from yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I think this is beyond sex. So it's not just about intercourse. I think for me in general, I have trouble letting go of my own desires and goals and getting curious about another person. Mm. And I, and then let's go beyond men. I think it's a human thing in general for us to be so self-focused and the word curiosity is such a powerful word because that's the word, that's the doorway into someone else's world. And it's hard for me. It's an afterthought but I'll take it. I'll take the afterthoughts and then I get quicker and quicker at getting curious. Um, but let's bring it back to just sex. All right. I'm horny. I'm turned on. I want sex with my partner. I've also got all this social conditioning that I believe that a man should be fucking a lot. Um, penetration is the way to have sex. We we're, we're conditioned with that as well. Mm -hmm. And also maybe this is more of a feminine thought, but is my relationship in trouble if we're not regularly fucking and having hot, passionate sex? I've worried about that and I've had partners worry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's all that built up and I need to notice that hopefully maybe by listening to a podcast like this and go, Oh yeah, I have all this. Can I share it with my partner? and have it be heard. Can I just share my experience? I'm not saying we have to fuck or anything. I just want to share what it's like as a guy, you know, I want sex, I want this and whatever, and talk about it and then find out what it's like from her point of view. What's it like for you to have me horny all the time and wanting to fuck? Mm. What's that like? And then I just really listen. That might occur as pressure. She might like that you have desire. Mm -hmm. um, this is intimacy is talking about what it is, then maybe you can find some solutions. I mean, I think mutual masturbation is one of the most fun games two people can play. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know my body, you know your body, let's lie next to each other and pleasure each other. Maybe we're gonna make out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You might find that's a solution or I'm just gonna masturbate and you're gonna watch or vice versa mm -hmm. or I'll stimulate you. Um, or maybe we'll have a makeout date that's not going to lead to sex. We set it up in advance. I, I'm a coach and I'm a logical guy, so I could think of all sorts of games mm. that we can come up with that don't involve uh, fucking. And if she's not interested in any of those, then I've still got masturbation. I can still get myself off and find ways to have a good time with my partner. So, so let me just get clarity for myself and listeners. So mutual masturbation can be pleasurable, can be connecting and define that. That is. Define that I'm, I'm rubbing myself. She's rubbing herself We're we're probably lying next to each other, but it doesn't have to be, be across the room. We might agree that there's no contact. We're just going to have this experience together. Um, or we might end up making out or it just dissolves into us helping each other. And then mm -hmm. I've done that. Uh, I did that with a friend. We, we'd never had any sex or made out before. And I suggested this idea. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, we were both wanting sex mm -hmm. and we did. And it was great. We couldn't have started there because we didn't feel it. And so, so Find a common place where, where you can start, which again might be back rubs or it might be cuddling. She might want 20 minutes of cuddling that's guaranteed no sex. Mm. The so, meta comment is get curious and talk about both of your know, feelings on both sides. That's the win. If you end up having sex, that's great. But if not, at least you're starting with intimacy. 
I like the word curious. I like the tone. I like the invitingness. It's it's much more open than well, why that or why aren't you uh, respond or what am I doing? You know, it's it's got a very nice invitingness to it. So I like that. Now I want to ask you to define hand sex because I think you were talking about that mutual masturbation can go into hand or is is it one where do they yeah apply? manual stimulation. So. Um, Two organizations I know of that, that teach this. One is One Taste, which is a bit, bit controversial, that organization, but they taught how to, um, one person would lie down, usually the woman, but it doesn't have to be. Clothes are mostly on, maybe the pants come off, and uh, a timer is set, mm. um, which is wonderful. You set a timer so that each person isn't thinking, oh, I need to stop this at some point, or when is it going to stop? Is he still interested and whatever? No, we know it's going to be 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, get some lube, get a towel ready, get some pillows, position her legs. Um, if it's the woman, get her comfortable, see if she wants any water. If you're really going to go to town, you might um, put on some music that you know she likes. Um, maybe get her favorite drink ready. It's a really good, just put some great attention on your partner. And then I'm just, I'm pausing because I'm thinking like how, in how much detail to go into. And then you'll start touching. You might stroke different parts of her body and then check if, if she wants you to touch her pussy. Um, or you might agree, we're just going to start there and you're listening. You're listening with your hands. You're listening with the body language. And you can actually, there's something called the training cycle, which I got from the Morehouse, um, their website, by the way, can I give them a plug? Mm. Yeah. Their website is lafayettemorehouse.com. And, uh, I did courses with them and trained in this and you can ask great questions that have yes or no answers. This is super important. Never ask your partner is, does this feel good? Never ask that question kind of puts them on the spot. Mm. You ask, a, you ask a question, um, it might be something like, would you like lighter touch? Mm. And then you thank them, whatever the answer. It's like, yes, no, I don't know, thank you. And then you can keep going. Would you like lighter touch? You're going to have to keep asking until you get to that point. And then, you might, then when she says no, or he says no, would you like firmer touch? You okay. get until you get the sweet spot. And then you might be like, would you like circles? Would you like penetration now? Or you can do it and see how it feels. You can kind of test it out. But I think it's great to have a research date. Let's find out about your body and what's good. And I'm going to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And all you've got to do is relax and say, yes, no, yes, no. And if you want, you can ask as well. There's another cycle for how you train from the bottom. Train someone to give you what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that might be another podcast episode. Well, let me go back. So you introduced this with sort of an explanation of what not to say or how not to structure it versus how to structure this. Could you restate that? Yeah. Don't ask, does this feel good? It doesn't really give you information that kind of expected to say yes. Mm -hmm. I would ask for something, ask for a change. Would you like more pressure? Would you like me to go faster? I mean, how many times you've been lying there ladies and it's too fast. <laughs> right it's awkward to say well why was sailor you know slow down but if he's asking you um would you like slower strokes would you you know with my hand or my penis or whatever um and keeps asking until you get that exact speed now you can relax even more and feel even more so this is called the the training cycle it's a way to find out what your partner wants without them having to get into their head and speak up a lot Nice. That's very helpful. So what's the one you said could be a future podcast? I really want to hear something on that, please. Oh, well, yeah, I was talking about the train. So this is the training cycle I've given a bit about when you're the one delivering the pleasure and you want to use a cycle to find out information. But there's another cycle that you can use from the bottom. If you're the one receiving, there's a, there's a nice training cycle and it's very simple. You find something right, 
like, I love that you're putting so much attention on me. Something you honestly find right. So you appreciate them. Then you ask for one small thing they can definitely do. Would you stroke a little faster? And then they do it and you say, thank you. That's it. It's also known as an appreciation sandwich. This is something great you're doing, right? You're winning in my eyes. Would you stroke a little faster or would you try a little lighter or would you try some penetration or I'd like some pressure on my clitoris. Would you try that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That feels much better. And then you rinse and repeat. You can keep going. That's a training cycle from the, from the bottom. Those are wonderful. So how does a guy bring this into his relationship? What are, what are some just sort of initial things he can great. do? Great. Great. Yeah. Well, it could be, Hey, you know, it's kind of expected in society. I was listening to this podcast and they say how it's expected in society that everything's reciprocal and we're like pleasuring each other at the same time. And they suggested that you can have a lot of fun if two people put their attention on one person's pleasure mm. as a whole new model and it can lead to sex or it can be agreed. It doesn't lead to sex. Um, and it's timed seems a bit weird, seems a bit clinical, but apparently it can be a lot of fun. And so I'm interested in trying it out. Do you want to try it out? We can, we'll set a timer for 30 minutes and I'm thinking I would, I would do you first. Um, and all you got to do is relax and feel your body. You can give me any direction if you want, or you can just relax. And uh, I think it'd be a pretty fun date. What do you say? Hmm. I like that. That's great. Yeah. You got, I got to warn you guys, it can be hard for any human um, to receive. Mm -hmm. And particularly after a lifetime of women having to put out and having to focus on what the guy wants and believing if it's hard, she's got to do something about it, about his erection. It might be a, a real game changer and hard for her to believe that you would really do it. I know when my partner said, well, let me do you. Oh, so confronting mm. to, to, to actually think about relaxing and letting her pleasure me and me doing nothing and trusting that she really wanted to brought up all sorts of stuff. So just bear in mind, you might face some resistance, but uh, I have faith in you to be able to seduce her into receiving pleasure. Just find, find some fun ways that she could do it. You might even say, we'll do it as a foot rub, non-sexual. Mm. Uh, but it can be a real game changer. I know communities of people, they got right into this. They, they would, they call it a due date or they call it orgasmic meditation. And they say, you know, I would do it with someone I would hug because it's not about mm. sex. It's not going to lead to sex. It's just I'm willing to receive pleasure. I'm not saying people have got to go that far, but it can be a fun tool to add, particularly if sex isn't happening. Mm. I believe this is a way to break it down into smaller steps where you can communicate and get back to more intimacy. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So what other things are not spoken or we haven't covered or touched on that might be helpful to... I notice when you say that and hearing that, I just feel so happy with what we've covered. Mm. I feel like, cause I, I talk about tough conversations and speaking truth a lot. And I also talk about business success and I've done a lot of training in man, woman dynamics. And I, I'm such a fan of intimacy. So I just love that you've, you've taken us there to all these great places. I don't normally get to talk about. There's nothing that's coming up for me as missing. Okay, good. I, I, um, I just, I would just recap by saying it's scary to speak truth. Firstly, most of us don't know what our own truth is um, because the mind doesn't just lay it out on a platter. Oh, here's your truth. We just know we might want more. We might not even be clear what that is or something might be bugging us and relationships are a great training ground to, get out a piece of paper and a pen and say, all right, if I was a hundred percent truthful, what are some desires I haven't communicated? Mm -hmm. What are some things that bug me mm -hmm. or that I'm concerned about in our relationship that I haven't communicated? It doesn't mean writing them down doesn't commit you to sharing them. 
It's mm -hmm. just a first step for you to start to reveal your truth to yourself. Journaling's good too, I think, for this and talking to a coach or a therapist. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got that, you might say to your partner, hey, this guy on this podcast was suggesting a special kind of date where we get together and we share a little deeper than what we normally do. We make a list with each other and then we take turns. We might even light a candle or we might have a talking stick or something. And then one person's going to share for about 10, 15 minutes. Then the other person has a chance to share impact. All right, hearing that, I feel all this impact. And you might go back and forth for a while. Then you switch. And then it's your partner's turn and they just share and you just listen. You, you, it's so important. You can't say a thing like, oh yeah, me too. No, you don't get to do that. You're, you're a therapist. I know I'm preaching to the choir. No, we, we need this out there. <laughs> yeah, you can take some turns to say, let's just go a little deeper. We'll share some of the things that are a little bit edgier. And then we commit either way at the end of it that, that we're going to hug and um, maybe give each other a foot rub or something, whatever. But See, it's so affirming to hear from a man what's good for a man and what a man needs to do. And a man needs, uh, wants sex, loves sex, you know, pleasure. It's good. You know, it's, it's very affirming. And um, by the way, I want to go back to talking stick. Could you define that? And yeah, just when, look, humans aren't very good at listening to each other. And <laughs> it's possible that men are worse. I don't know, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if men are worse. And they are. <laughs> It's look, you start tell, telling me something about something in our relationship. I might want to jump to defend myself pretty fast. If it seems like I might be doing something wrong, it's a habit. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just a habit. And so if it's set up initially with, so this is why talking sticks were invented. I believe if there's something that I'm holding that represents that I have the space and we have an agreement and a timer is set. And I know I've got clear directions as a man. I know my job is to listen. Maybe I can take some notes so I don't forget everything. And then I know my job at the end of it is maybe to share impact or to recreate you. Meaning let me reflect back what I heard so that you know you were heard and then you'll have a chance to correct me. Like if I know the rules, it's not, it's not too hard. But if, we're just doing a sharing session and you talk, I may not know the rules. And so I'm going to jump in and you're not going to get to surrender. You're not going to get to trust and really relax open into my listening. So I, I think it's just smart to set up the rules of the game at the, at the top. So a listening stick again is talking stick could just be a stick. You could, you get a toilet brush or a ladle from the kitchen and whoever's holding the stick is the one that's going to be talking and then you trade it back and forth. I mean, it might seem silly, but it's so practical. It's a re physical reminder that I'm talking now and Hey, I've got the ladle. Mm. Shit, zip it. <laughs> no, I like that. And I like uh, simplistic rituals because we think communication is just going to happen and we think <sighs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> simplistic rituals. And as a guy, give me rules. Like, you can tell me how this game's going to go and I can play it. <laughs> but otherwise, look out. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll start wrapping up. It's been a delight. And I wanted to know if you have something you wish to offer the listeners. Yeah, I do. Firstly, I have my own podcast. Uh, it's reasonably new called Tough Conversations with David Wood. I'd love to have you subscribe. Um, it's all the same link for, for, for both of my offers is uh, playforreal.life is the website. You can subscribe there. Um, there's also a blueprint on how to have a tough conversation, which you can download for free, the same link. And if something resonated, uh, you know, generally I do a lot of business slash life coaching. So I don't do a lot of just life coaching uh, and relationships, but I'm open to it. So if something resonated here and you're a man or a woman or a couple and you'd like someone to help guide you through some of these practices, I'd love to hear from you. I do discovery sessions 
if you qualify for a discovery session, I don't charge. It's because of how I find the right people. It's how I find the right people to work with long term. So um, you can request a session by going to playforreal.life. Click on request a session. There's an assessment, which is really valuable and useful anyway. And then if we do a session, we'll explore each other and see if coaching could have a major impact on your life. And if it does, we'll talk about setting up coaching. And if not, then at least we'll have a great discussion about your life and maybe your relationship. Thank you, David. And, and thank you for offering uh, help coaching for couples. Yes. I love that. And I want to do more of it. Mm. The, the sessions I've done, I'm a great space holder. Mm. And so this is the problem when you, you say people assume communication is going to happen mm. and it doesn't, but with someone else who can see the whole picture and, and you, you would know this, hold space for it. I love it. I can even be like, Hey, Jim, I'm going to need you to hold on that right now because it's not your turn, right? <laughs> or Jenny, what's not being said? Um, I love that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. This was fabulous. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank my you. My pleasure. I think this has been the best part of my day. So thanks oh. for reaching out. Okay. And uh, this is a thrill for me. Okay. You've been listening to Tough Conversations with David Wood. Now it's action time. Mastering your tough conversations will have a major impact on your team, your company, and you as a high-performing executive or entrepreneur. If you're ready, request a discovery session with me at playforreal.life so we can transform your team, your company, and you. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I would love you to help me spread this message of tough conversations in a very simple way. Just leave a public review at playforreal.life forward slash podcast. And you may hear me read it out loud and thank you live on a future podcast. Now, let's play.